What's up guys and welcome back to Mon Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Heya, how you doing? If you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're here to see Odysseus and the Cyclops. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on the topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be discussing the Odyssey Book 9. So if I could summarize Odyssey Book 9 into a one sentence it would be that Odysseus stabs a Cyclops' eye out with a pointy stick. That is the only important thing that really happens in this book. There are other things that are funny. In fact, there's one thing that I actually really wanted to make the title of this episode. However, it just wouldn't be good for the keyword search on YouTube. And it's also, nobody would know what that was. It's the whole Cyclops thing. It's the pointy stick thing. It's the stabbing thing. That's what we're focusing on today. So why don't I just roll into the video so that I can make all of that make some sense. So where I left you last time though, we ended up having Alcanus ask Odysseus in front of this whole room of people being like, who the are you? Like, we know that you're a really nice guy and all of this, but we don't know where you're from, we don't know your name. So Odysseus begins this whole book by telling Alcanus that it's been really lovely to hear Demodocus, the bard, to hear Demodocus sing of Troy because what he sings is truthful and he says that he's clearly been gifted by a god because he knows all these stories back to front. Something that I cut out from the editing of the last episode was that Odysseus really did accentuate like how great Demodocus is and wanted to treat him really well and so gave him this like great cut of meat and all of this and so we start off this book by just accentuating that point there. Odysseus is just like he's a great guy because all of these things are truthful but now is the time that he has to be truthful himself and so he tells everybody to like gather around he's going to tell them um uh, his his whole journey there. Odysseus actually starts off by saying that actually all of them know his name. He says that unfortunately my reputation has preceded me in this case. You guys already know who I am because I am the great Odysseus and I come from Ithaca and I'm a son of Laertes. And he has this like whole great moment where the whole, you know, room, the whole hall, they're all just like, oh my goodness, what are you joking? The Odysseus in my hall? Which is like really cute, honestly. It's like this really like funny fangirling sort of moment. And Odysseus does say that even though there's nothing great on Ithaca, that Ithaca itself isn't like a great island. He does say that it's a great place for raising a family, for raising children and all of this and so he really does want to get home and he highlights right now that Calypso is one of the reasons why he he stayed away from home for so long he says that that story is true but also that Circe so this is the second time we get a mention of Circe before you meet her and he says that Circe also kept him away from home because both of these women wanted him as their husband so wouldn't let them leave wouldn't let him leave even from where they lived however neither of them captured his heart because he only ever wanted to go home because he misses he misses the land his people and his parents he does not mention Penelope nor does he mention Telemachus in this moment and you're reading it like what <laughs> you do that? But anyways, he does say that now is the time that he's going to tell them of the uh, toils that happened to him after Troy. And so he's like, everybody sit closer because this is going to be juicy. So he doesn't tell us what happens immediately after Troy itself. But what he does start with is when he and his men left the shores of Troy. So they first of all leave and they make the stop at this place called Is Ismaris. Wow, I just totally tripped over that. So they stop at Ismaris and when they get off the boat there, they ransack the whole place. They take over the stronghold, the whole sort of lot, which to me, when you read it and most people read it they're just like this seems totally unnecessary because they weren't coming at you with like weapons straight away like you got off your boats and you attacked these people for seemingly no reason they end up winning and Odysseus is a bit like okay now that we've got the plunder from this place they got all the gold they got all the gifts and they split it up equally between all the men he says now that we have that let's leave like we don't need to stay here any longer but unfortunately all of his men they want to stay around they want to make more sacrifices they want to enjoy um the coast I don't know they want to enjoy the view or some sort of like that and so Odysseus is outnumbered so he says okay fine we'll leave in the morning now all of them stay overnight on the beaches and <laughs> unfortunately at this moment we then have the surrounding towns hear about what Odysseus and his men have done which obviously obviously they're not happy with so they show the up and they actually <laughs> there's like another whole battle that goes on here where Odysseus and his men are fighting all of the surrounding towns of this place of Ismaris and basically long story short Odysseus and his men end up getting defeated they only lose like six men so it's not like a massive loss but this then causes them to retreat get on their boats and then they leave okay so they're now they, they, they just leave Ismaris and they uh, as they're out on sea they end up coming across a hurricane that was sent to them by Zeus because Zeus also doesn't like Odysseus so they are forced to stop on another island where they stay for two days and two nights while the hurricane sort of disperses then they can get back on the uh, boat by the way they had done all this like wailing and stuff for the men that they had lost the six men that they had lost because that's respectful that's what you're supposed to do they get back on the boat they start sailing and Odysseus says that they are like literally like in line with Ithaca that they can see Ithaca they're gonna go home but unfortunately the north wind shows the 
fuck up and just ruins it for them. The North Wind is like, nope, not today, Satan, and just drives them well off course to this other island. This island is what I wanted to name the episode after, actually. So they end up on this island and they end up on the beach and they can't really see any signs of inhabitants. But something that, that they will do throughout this whole journey is that they will get on the beach of some island, they will then go and find the people because they're looking for hosts. Once again, hospitality is a big thing. So Odysseus sends three of his men when they wash up on this island, he sends three of their men to go and to figure out what is what is going on. So two of them are gonna go and talk to the inhabitants to go and figure out if they're nice, to go and figure out if they will host them and all of this. And one of them will be a messenger to then run back to the rest of the guys by the boats to either say, you know, you can come and chill out or like you can come, they need help, whatever. So they leave and Odysseus never hears from them again. <laughs> Just like they, they walk away and he's like, where the f did those guys go? So he's got to go and find them. So single-handedly, he walks through the, the woods and all of this and he goes to find them. And that's when he discovers that this is an island of lotus eaters. Okay, so what does that mean? It, it means verbatim that basically, that they eat all of these lotuses that they grow on the island because they are fruity, they are floral, they are sweet and all of this. And so they eat them, but, but these people have zero desire to do anything on the island because they're just too busy sitting around eating lotuses, which in translation, it's not explicitly says, but they are high as sh Okay, so these lotus eaters give Odysseus' men the lotuses, so they have no desire to do anything at all, let alone send the messenger back to Odysseus to be like, by the way, these guys are high as sh and they're eating lotuses. So Odysseus walks over, sees them just sort of sitting about and eating lotuses, and is like, what? What are you doing? Guys, come on! So he does a full mama bear thing where he just picks them up by their ears and drags them back to the shore and tells everybody to get back on the boats and he's just like, we are not staying here in case any of you eat any of the lotuses. Look at these dummies over here. Get on the boats, we're leaving. But anyways, after this island, the men get back on the boat, like I just said, and they end up on the Cyclopses Island. So when they first end up there, they don't actually know that Cyclopses are obviously inhabiting this island. We have to bear in mind that Odysseus is telling this story in hindsight. So he knows a lot more than he knew in the moment, right? So in the moment, him and his men just show up on these shores and the first thing that they notice is that there are loads of goats everywhere. He was like, what are all of these doing here? Heaven forbid a farmer could exist on this island in order to corral these and control them. Like apparently there are just so many there. But when Odysseus is telling the story to all of the Phaeacians, he says that he knew, he knows now even, and he didn't know at the time that this was the Cyclops' island and these people are lawless. They are brutes. They have their own individual laws rather than like a state law if that makes sense so when it comes to their own families they have their own rules for how how you know they govern their wives and how they govern their children how they run their households all of that sort of stuff is is individual rather than state run they're on the beach and they see all these goats and odysseus is like well you know what we should probably do eat some of those so they go over and they take nine for each of the boats except for his own that they take 10 sheep for his so that they can like really enjoy all of the meat and everything they sit and they feast and they have like a really nice time odysseus makes a note here that he says anybody else like any other sort of civilized person or being would have figured out a way to trade these <laughs> these goats to like make money make profit or something but the the cyclopses haven't really hacked the whole you know boating thing and seafaring thing so they haven't hacked that's why there's such a goat problem basically they really highlight that there are loads and loads of just goats and sheep everywhere on this island but in the morning they can see smoke from all of this fire that's coming from the island and so odysseus tells all of his men i think we're on the wrong we're on the wrong beach right now this is pretty useless we should get back on the boats go around the corner uh, disembark there and then um, uh, go and explore and see who exists here and all of this. So the men get back on the boats, they literally go around the corner, get off the boats, and then Odysseus picks 12 of his favorite men. Well, 12 including him, but he picks a bunch of them and he says, all of us are gonna go and venture out and we'll come back and we'll tell you guys what's up. So Odysseus and this little army that he has formed from his actual army, they see this cavern up, which is kind of close to the beach, but like not super close to the beach. Like it's close enough they can see it. And it's shrouded in this like overgrown laurel. And so they decide to go there first because they can see that there are all of these like goats and sheep and, and sort of like pastures outside of it. So he's like, okay, well, I think something lives there. So we should probably go and try there first. So they all walk up to the cave, to, to the cavern and there's nobody in there. Okay. So, so they walk in and it's just like the sort of gaping hole in the rock. And they notice there are a couple of things in there that are a bit like red flags. Like clearly somebody lives there, but it's also like, how big is this thing? Like what's going on type of thing. So they go in and they see that there are all these racks for drying cheese first and foremost. They're a bit like, okay. And then he knows to the back that there are these three different pens for clearly some cattle of some sort, the sheep and the goats, he presumes. And they are all ordered. And then there are all of these like pails of milk on the wall, like hanging on the wall. There's whey in some of them. Uh, there's just like regular milk in some of them. And then there's like a, a, a fire in the middle that's not lit. Okay, so that's what they walk into. So one of the men sees all of this and turns to Odysseus and is like, look, I've got a 
better plan than, than what you want to do, which is clearly meet the host. I think we should just take the cheese and run. Like literally, that's what he says. And Odysseus is like, well, that's not the plan. That's absolutely not what we're doing. We're going to stick around and we're going to wait for our host because even they have brought gifts for their host. So something that they had brought with them on the boat from um, the, the first place is Morris, where they had, you know, gone and plundered and all of this. So they brought some wine. So they were given this wine as a gift by a priest of Apollo. There's some context for a priest of Apollo type of thing, because the reason why they let this only person survive, the initial plunder of the city, is because the Greeks don't have a very good track record when it comes to priests of Apollo, right? This is like a whole thing in the Iliad. I'm not going to explain it here, but just trust me that they were really smart in saying, oh, you're a priest of Apollo. You can live that's fine and so that guy ends up giving them this wine which is supposedly amazing like literally when Odysseus is describing this wine to the Phaeacians he's basically orgasming over it he's just like this wine is so strong and it's so amazing and he gave them loads of wine but for each cup of wine because in the ancient world you have to dilute wine for each cup you would need 20 cups of water that is how strong this thing is which is like unheard of one to 20 man like this is strong but the men had brought that to the Cyclops's cave so Odysseus is like well no we're gonna sit around and we're gonna wait until this guy comes home so we can offer him the wine and I also want the gifts that this host could possibly offer us which is a little bit selfish but anyways the men listen to him and they all make camp in the cave they do take some of the cheese um and they offer some to the gods they're like here here's some cheese and then they eat some of it by themselves they drink some wine and they have their own little fire going in the cave and they just sit around and they wait for the guy who lives in the cave to come back. Finally, when nightfall does come around, then the inhabitant of the cave does come back and he comes in with all of the cattle. This giant cyclops shows the fuck up. Comes in with all the cattle, lets the cattle in and then closes this door, this door. The door is this like ginormous rock. Gigantic, actually my dad gets really annoyed when I say that. So gigantic or enormous, pick one. But it goes in front of the opening of the cave, right? And he even says, Odysseus even says, that the cyclops shouldn't have been able to move this rock. It is that big that like, he's even shocked that the cyclops himself can move this thing so comfortably. He then allots all of his, you know, the, the sheep and the goats into their various pens. He then goes over, he then milks all of them. He sets aside half of these pails for milk, just, just milk itself. And then half of them are left to curdle for, um, what's a magic? Uh, uh, cheese. That was the word I was looking for. So he does that. And one thing that he'd also brought in with him was all of this firewood. So he ends up starting the fire in the middle of the room. And when he lights it, he then notices that Odysseus and his men are just like cowering in the corner because when the Cyclops walked in, Odysseus was like, what the f is that? And so they went to the corner to hide. And now the, the Cyclops is now seeing them. And he's like, what the hell? Who are you? And what are you doing in my home? Which is a very normal response. You know what, for the most part, you're not gonna like this, this Cyclops, right? He's not a very nice guy. But in this moment, you're a bit like, I mean, same. I think that that's a bit of an entitlement moment for Odysseus where like he expects all this behavior from his host, but like he just showed up in this guy's home, made himself comfortable. The guy has no idea who he is. Shouldn't he wait to be invited in? Isn't that part of hospitality? Odysseus then explains to the Cyclops that actually he expects him to host him. He literally says that to him. And he says that they have come from Troy, that they fought underneath Agamemnon and, and they were fighting in this 10 year war and everything. And they are trying to find a host on this island because they have dealt with many perils. But he obviously is terrified of Polyphemus. Oh, you don't actually know his name. I'm so sorry. But at this point, we just know him as Cyclops. So he's terrified of the Cyclops. And he tells the Cyclops in this moment, that all strangers and all guests are protected by Zeus under the hospitality laws. And so therefore the Cyclops should be wary of that and should be aware of that. And obviously Polyphemus doesn't react really well to this and he turns around and he's just like, you fool, who do you think you are telling me that I should fear the gods? None of the Cyclopses fear the gods. And he ends this by being like, well, I'm just kind of curious though. Where are your boats? Like where are the rest of your men? Is this it? Or like what's going on? I wrote that down on my post-it note. He says, I would just like to know <laughs> line 316 or around line 316. Odysseus knows that this is a trick though, and so he doesn't tell the Cyclops the truth. He lies to the Cyclops and he says that actually Poseidon has dashed all of their um, boats against their shore, against the, the Cyclops island shore, and so it, he doesn't have any boats. So they are stranded on this island and that's why they need help. Instead of having a response to this, the Cyclops just stands up, picks up two of Odysseus's men, hits their heads on the floor so their brains sort of gush out, and then eats them. I kid you the f not like literally bone marrow entrails and all just downs them and all of Odysseus's men are standing there the surviving ones are like oh my sweet baby Jesus what just happened I should really say sweet baby Zeus I should really start changing that best part is that the Cyclops then washes them down with like a glug of milk and then he's just chilling and he's just like well now I'm not that hungry anymore but thanks for that and again all the men are like huh okay we're 
Initially, Odysseus wants to do what anybody would probably want to do as a leader, in those times anyways, but he just wants to run over to um, the Cyclops. I keep wanting to say his name, but we don't hear it yet. So he wants to run over to the Cyclops and he just wants to stab him, like sort of where the liver is and the gut and all of that, and just kill him. But he does realize, this is really smart, he realizes that the door of the cave is still closed and it's this giant rock, right? Like I just said. And Odysseus is like, I couldn't move that none of us even all of us together couldn't have moved that rock so we can't have the cyclops be dead at that point because what the f could we have done then we would have just rotted in a cave and you do read that and you're like yeah i mean i probably wouldn't have thought of that but like yeah, that's that's true. So they've really just got to wait about until morning and that's exactly what they do. They fall asleep, they then wake up and it's the morning. The Cyclops wakes up and he does do another round of milking for his, um, his you know, sheep and the goats and all of this. I want to say cattle, but does cattle involve cows? I don't actually know, but either way. So he does that whole sort of thing. He then moves the door of the um, home. Uh, he moves it away. He then leads all of them out to go into the pastures. And that's when Odysseus has to sort of hash this plan out now, right? So he's got to think of a plan. He's got to be fast on his feet. And in the corner of the cave, he notices that there is this like um this this long olive rod this long olive wood thing and it's so big that it could be like the mast of a ship right that's how long i don't want to say stick but like it's a really long plank of wood like it's a huge thing so odysseus sees this and he orders some of his men to come with him and they chop off a big bit of it like not using all of it but they chop off a massive part of it and he instructs his men that they're going to smooth it down they're going to spend the whole day doing this they're going to smooth it down and then they are going to sharpen the edge to a point and uh that's what they're doing with this thing so all the men start doing that and then once it's been done odysseus then puts it over the fire so that he chars the end of it so it's stronger and it's you know it, it, it stays in place and it doesn't snap and then once it cools down he then hides it behind this dung because there's like loads of dung this like wet dung from like the sheep and the goats and all of this sort of so he hides this long rod this now pointy stick this pointy sharp stick behind all of that so that the cyclops doesn't see it when he comes back from his day of not farming but just like roaming roaming all of the animals outside. Odysseus then goes back to all of his men and he says that they are going to draw lots and they're going to decide which of the remaining men, because remember that two of them are dead, that <laughs> he's gonna decide of the remaining of them who is going to help him stab this thing into the Cyclops' eye because that's the plan, he's explained it all to them. So they all draw lots and uh, fortunately, it ends up being the four other men that he would have chosen himself, five including him, and they are going to help drive this thing into the Cyclops' eye that evening. So when nightfall comes, the Cyclops comes back into the cave and he does the normal routine that we just saw. So he, you know, milks all of his, his sheep and his goats and he leaves half of the pails aside. He leaves the other half of the pails aside for cheese, the other half for milk and all of this. Then he goes over to Odysseus's men. He picks up two more of them, dashes them on the floor and then eats them. And obviously they're like, Sweet. and just by luck, just by luck, it doesn't happen to be any of the men who are going to be stabbing this thing into his eye. I just always think that's a really wonderful coincidence for Odysseus. Instead of drinking milk though, to top off his, uh, his, his you know, dinner of men, but Odysseus just now offers him some wine. So this is where the wine comes into it. But he offers him this wine and he just says, you know, like to wash down what you just ate because we're totally not scarred by this. You should have some wine. He hands him this like massive bowl of the wine and he says that he can't understand why the f anybody would want to be his guest anyways. He's like, you're a terrible host because you're eating all of my men and that's like not really hospitable. And I would never recommend that anybody come and visit you. However, have some wine and, and chill out. And so the Cyclops takes some of the wine and he drinks the whole bowl of this really strong wine. Drinks the whole bowl and he's like, make me an the bowl and so Odysseus is like that's totally chill and Odysseus ends up making him three bowls of wine which he drinks down to like the last drop this Cyclops is drunk as he is pissed so in his drunken state the Cyclops asks Odysseus what his name is and if he tells him his name then he will give him a gift in return so Odysseus replies and he tells him that his name is nobody. Now that is like the most famous thing from pretty much all of mythology. It's one of the most famous things from all of mythology when Odysseus tells the Cyclops that his name is nobody because he's hatched this plan, which we don't know the extent of it just yet and like how nobody fits into it. We will in a hot second. But that is vital that you know that that happens in this book. Minus the whole pointy stick thing. The fact he says his name is nobody, utterly important. Now because the Cyclops is so drunk at this point, he just falls back and he sort of starts like giggling or whatever. And he says to Odysseus that his gift is that he's gonna be eating him last. He's like, thank you for telling me your name. You will be the last to be eaten. You'll have to watch everybody else die and everybody else go into my stomach. Mwahahaha. Very like Kronos-esque sh** going on here. He ends up just passing the f out on the floor, right? And so he then starts vomiting. He's that drunk, guys. He passes out, he starts vomiting and up with all the wine comes also like human body parts and it's like really gross. And so Odysseus sees that now is his time. So he, he tells all of his men to like get ready and they take the stick and they put it over the fire again so it's hot and they walk over to Polyphemus and they stab his eye with this really hot 
pointy stick and they keep it in there for a while, right? They start moving this thing around because they want to make sure that like actually the eye is, you know, bust at this point. And remember, it's his only eye. He's a cyclops. So he's on the floor. He's screaming. He can barely control himself. And the men only stop when they start seeing blood oozing from this singular eye in his head. And you're like, oh, it's what? So he lets out this huge roar, which means that all of the other cyclopses hear this and they all come to his door because the door is now closed, right? So the door is closed again. Whenever Polythemus leaves, the door closes. And then whenever he comes in, the door closes. So it's never just like open. But the guys, the other one of his friends, his other Cyclops mates, his neighbors, they all come to the door and they're sort of shouting through the door. They're like, yo, Polyphemus, you good, bro? And he yells from inside and he yells at his Cyclops friends and he goes, nobody is killing me. Nobody is stabbing my eye. And it is just brilliant. Like all of a sudden you realize like how smart Odysseus is and you're just like, me. That was so good because the Cyclops is now outside. They think he's just lost his nutter at this point. So the Cyclops from outside, they sort of shout back in and they're like, okay, well, if no one is killing you, if nobody is killing you, then you clearly have some sort of a plague that Zeus sent you or someone sent you because you shouldn't be screaming this much if you're okay. So what we would suggest is you should pray to daddy Poseidon and hopefully they spare your soul. But aside from that, we're going to go and leave because we don't want to be infected with whatever the you have. And so they leave, they leave. And he's just left in his cave with like zero eye now in his head. And Odysseus and his men being like well chuffed with themselves of how they have hatched this plan against this ginormous, this gigantic Cyclops. It's brilliant. So Polyphemus is not doing so well. He walks over to the entrance of the cave and he moves it over. He manages to feel where the door is, moves the rock over and he sits in the entrance. So now the men are just like, well, me now what do we do odysseus hatches this new plan he has to hatch plan 2.0 now where he has to figure out an escape route because if, if polyphemus is sitting in the gateway there's no way that they can leave without polyphemus knowing sure he can't see but he's huge we need to remember how big he is and how much of the cave entrance that he he you know takes up so odysseus has to sit down he's got to think and he looks back over to the pens and he realizes that he can use the sheep he's just like this is our way out so he constructs this plan they're, they're gonna sleep through the night right and so in the morning he tells his men that this is the plan, that they're gonna have three sheep each. And on the middle sheep underneath, then a man is going to be like clinging on to the belly of the sheep, to the fur of the sheep. And then all three of the sheep will be sort of side by side. They're gonna walk through so that when Polyphemus, if he feels the sheep, then he'll just think that they're sheep and not a man trying to like awkwardly slide <laughs> on the side of the cave entrance. Like, sorry mate, which is a brilliant plan. And Odysseus for himself, gives himself like the biggest of, of all the sheep. So he just needs the one. Everybody else has three. He has the one. Bear in mind, there's only six of them left anyways. So it's still a lot of sheep. It's also a lot of maths that I'm not gonna do sitting in front of the camera. So they all have the sheep. They all take their spots. When dawn comes, the sheep know that it's now their time to leave the cave and to go out to the pastures, right? Because that's what they do every single day. So Polyphemus doesn't move from the front of, of this whole cave. And so when all of the sheep are walking through, he has his hand down. So when the sheep go through, he's feeling all of them. The men manage to go through no problem. He just feels top of the sheep, doesn't know that there's men underneath the sheep, totally fine. And it gets to Odysseus' sheep and it's like the biggest and oldest sheep. And it goes through and the sheep stops, right? And Polyphemus puts his hand on the sheep and Odysseus is bricks hanging onto this thing. He's just like, this is never gonna work. Oh God. And Polyphemus has this moment where he talks about what nobody did, what Odysseus did to him. Telling the sheep, he's clearly lost his rocker anyways. He's telling the sheep this thing. And then he says to the sheep, you used to be the first of all the sheep to leave the cave. And now you are the last one because you were the oldest. Like you need to remember who you once were. It's this really like motivational moment. But either way, the sheep leaves. So the sheep walks through and then Odysseus and his men from underneath the sheep, they like drive the sheep. I, this is me driving sheep from underneath them. They drive the sheep down to the beach, down onto the boats. And Odysseus is like, get the boats going we are not sticking around this long so the men start getting all the boats moving right so now they're all out to sea and odysseus can't just take this as a win and he turns around this is when odysseus everybody's a bit like oh for sake he turns around and he yells back at the island and he yells back at polyphemus and he's like hey you you brute i got away and i'm safe he also says right now that polyphemus is a cannibal which i'm not really sure that he is because polyphemus doesn't eat any other cyclopses he just eats humans which he's not a human so i guess that it doesn't make him a, a, a cannibal but you can totally correct me in the comments below I, I have no idea he says you're a cannibal and i would never send anybody here and zeus will make you pay for how you treated us and how you were so inhospitable and all of this sort of stuff which obviously polyphemus pipes up and he just is not happy with this so he picks up a huge boulder and he throws it and he throws it into the into the water and it lands close enough to all of the boats this is one of the funniest things it lands really close to the boats and it starts guiding them back to the shore of the cyclops island and odysseus starts 
I'm panicking and all the men are like, no, 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 we're not going back there. Absolutely not. Literally, Odysseus is screaming at them, just being like, just keep rowing, keep going. And so they start rowing really fast and then they manage to get a little bit further away. Now, they are in safer grounds in the water. They can still see the island because they're still close enough. Again, Odysseus feels like he needs to antagonize Polyphemus, which even one of his crewmates turns around and goes, really? Really? Like we only just survived the last rock issue. Are you really going to put us through that again? Odysseus ignores him and he turns around and he goes, I just want you to know that it was Odysseus who blinded you, the great war hero, blah, blah, like all of this sort of shebang. And Polyphemus has a moment where he calls back to Odysseus and he says, wow, that's actually really weird because I did get a prophecy once upon a time that said that a man called Odysseus was going to come. He was going to come from Troy. He was going to be the son of Laertes and he was going to blind me. But he has some great trash talk because he finishes this off by saying, I never expected that you would be Odysseus because I wasn't expecting such a spineless wimp who only wanted to get me drunk and attacked me that way. That is not the act of a hero and you're puny. I expected a much bigger guy than you. He calls him a wet noodle basically and then he says you should come back to the island because I'll treat you more hospitably now that I know that you're Odysseus. And obviously Odysseus calls back and he's like, not likely, mate. Which I have to say, this whole exchange of trash talk, 10 out of 10 on both of their parts. Very proud that finally after the whole Iliad, we got some good, some good back and forth. So Polyphemus then calls to his father and he says, look Poseidon, I fucking hate that guy. So now we hate that guy. That's how family works, right? So you're gonna hate this guy and you're gonna make his trip really, really fucking difficult. If he's fated to make it home, make sure he comes back to like, a house that's in pain, a house that is crumbling, a house that is just like not the way that he left it. But if he can die at sea, then kill him because I'm really over it. And he picks up another rock and he throws it over to where Odysseus and his men are into the um, sea. It doesn't hit the boat again. It, it lands like close to the stern of the boat. But Poseidon obviously hears his prayer because we know that Poseidon hates him. But this is the reason why, okay? This is the episode why Poseidon hates Odysseus and why he has decided to make his whole life miserable. Now we understand. So the impact of this boulder though, it then has Odysseus and his men uh, go off onto another island and they end up sort of, sh not shipwrecked, but they end up getting there and then they have to get off the boats. They then wail for the men that they had lost because they lost all those men to, you know, being eaten by Polyphemus and all that. So they wail for them. They then wait there overnight. They, they sleep on the beach and then they get back on the boats and then they start sailing. And that is the end of book nine. So I'm very thrilled that we got to discuss a very famous episode in all of mythology. And so, yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll be seeing you next time with book 10 where we will finally be meeting our lovely lady Cersei, our lovely sorcerer Cersei. And I'm very excited to talk about that with you guys. So we will be seeing you next time with a little bit of, um, of magic, I guess. So see you next time. <laughs>